Hello and welcome to Nevermind the Bar Chart with myself, Mark Pack, and this time it's lovely to welcome back to the show Professor Jane Green. Welcome Jane. Hi Mark, thanks so much for having me. Now a few days ago you and one of your colleagues released an intriguing new report about the state of British politics which has generated plenty of headlines about how the idea of the Red Wall may in fact be a little bit of a red herring. I'll include a link to the full report, of course, in the show notes, but let's kick off with just what were the main findings from your piece, Jane? So what we wanted to ask the question about whether or not it's we can make this inference that because the Conservatives have been making inroads into areas of the country that are more deprived and that have higher levels of unemployment, that we can say that the Conservatives are supported by people that are indeed poorer and economically feeling economically insecure and this so that the motivation for this is kind of many it went in many directions and we were interested in kind of properly understanding whether this left behind argument which which I guess in a way relates as much to Brexit as it does then to the conservative gains since Brexit you know like how how could we understand that better and so we wanted to explore the sense of economic grievances Mm. and if you go and kind of think about how would we know whether someone feels economically insecure or how would we know if they have like kind of personal economic grievances and one way you could look at that is to say well people on lower incomes they vote in this way or people with working class social class backgrounds they work voting this way now the problem with that is that you can be older And you can be really secure economically, but you can have a very low income because you don't need a high income anymore and you're living on a pension and you've got large savings and so on. And you may have a working class background, but the kind of decline of working class jobs, deindustrialization, the rise of automation, all of these things, you know, haven't necessarily meant that you yourself have been in an economically precarious position. So so the main aim was to explore this again. And it, and it goes back to the heart. It's kind of ironic because it goes back to the heart of what James Canagosorian was saying when he said, you know, these should be more Tory voting than they in, indeed are because, you know, there's lots of homeowners and so on. So if, if you're a homeowner, and you feel economically secure, but you live in a deprived part of the country, that doesn't mean, obviously, that then we kind of, those voters are the left behind. They might And so just to pick a stereotype to illustrate that point, if I understand right, the sort of person that you're particularly interested in is, say, somebody who has maybe been in a skilled manual job for decades, didn't go to university, now retired, But because of the age cohort they were in, they were able to buy their own home, their mortgage is paid off, they have a state pension, they might have some occupational final salary pension scheme on top, and therefore their income is potentially quite modest, but Mm -hmm. essentially their economic outlook is quite a comfortable and secure one because they own their own home, they've got some guaranteed pension income coming in, and therefore they're not the caricature of, of a sort of left behind person. Who, for whom the economy and so on has just not dealt them well. They're actually maybe a low-income person, but one for whom in many ways the pension and housing situations yeah. of the post-war era have actually served them really well. They're almost the opposite of the left behind in that sense. Exactly. I mean, and it's, you know, it, and that's really, it's a lovely way of summarising it. So thank you. You know, I think when we, you know, it's just kind of putting, joining up all the dots when we think about kind of wealth inequalities, we know that those are age-based in the country. So we know there are lots of older people that do indeed have a lot more wealth in forms of assets, homes, and those homes have appreciated over time. But it, we also know that those people who didn't go to university in sort of former generations, older generations, didn't go to university because they didn't need to go to university as mm. much as a university degree is needed now to have a secure job and to be, have the expectation of owning a home and so on and so forth. And so the, the meaning of being somebody who isn't a graduate has changed over time. So, so it's true that you know many of the older people in the population who have voted for Brexit and also voting Conservative now, indeed are lower, have lower levels of education, haven't gone to higher education, but they, didn't, they really didn't need to, and it wasn't the norm. So if you were kind of you know getting a foothold on the property ladder and also in the job market um, in your 20s and 30s, you know, 30 or 40 years ago, then you just didn't need to have a degree for the other jobs that you need to have a degree for now. And, you know, you wouldn't have needed the kind of income and savings to buy a house as you need to now. So we know all of these things, but it's just kind of putting all of that together and asking, therefore, okay, well, here's a basic question. 
who who feels in Britain today economically insecure? Where do they live? And what, what kind of expectations might be, we have about who those people should be? So, you know, when we really think about that, there's kind of two expectations. One is that you should expect older people in the country on average to feel more secure. Of course, it's not everybody, but also it really should be younger generations of non-graduates who are now struggling more. So if we think about those kind of impacts of globalization I was talking about, and it's harder, to, so it's harder to get a secure job, it's harder to compete in a knowledge economy, you need a degree for lots of the kind of stable secure jobs that would give you an income return. And also, if you're not a graduate, you're less likely to have family wealth, because we know, you know, just because of the selection into higher education to university, that, that there's still inequalities in the system. So if you're a graduate, you're much more likely to have family wealth, not all graduates will, but you're much more likely to. So our expectation was that it would be younger non-graduates who were really suffering. And, and that was, you know, the data we collected for this was before 2019, because we were doing quite a lot of work for the British election study before 2019 to kind of explore as much as we could things that might have then a kind of prediction value onto the election that, you know, could or could or could not have been coming down the track. Of course, it came earlier than we than we realized. But, but so we did this in 2018. And of course, we expect now for lots of these things to be worse because of the pandemic and because of the because of the existing current cost of living crisis. So anyway, so you asked me about the main findings. All I've really done so far is kind of tell you why we're interested in this. Or what do we expect? But essentially, well, you've we... given a hint about a sort of a double factor, I guess. One is yeah. these people in, for example, red wall constituencies who are low income but economically secure. Yeah. And therefore might end up having political views and political choices that don't fit a neat narrative of, you know, poor Northern English constituencies, yeah. etc. Yeah. But also there's the hint there, isn't there, that amongst apparently affluent graduates, mm -hmm. there may be a much greater degree of insecurity than it appears that although their incomes may be higher than that, that first group, if they don't own their own home and are thinking, well, crikey, even if I have no avocados for the next 30 years, I'm still not going to be able to afford my own home. There might yeah. be much greater insecurity under the surface than, than one would would look at from sort of superficial appearances. Yeah. And I think so. That's right. So the younger graduates are going to be less economically secure than the older non-graduates and the older graduates. Older graduates are particularly unusual. So you're going to see this age relationship with economic insecurity. But it's also, I mean, there's so much focus on graduates who can't get, you know, really good jobs. So every once in a while, we get a story, don't we, of a graduate who's gone to university, paid all that money in tuition fees, struggling to buy a house, struggling to get a good job, struggling to get a, a good job that makes use of their degree. And, and therefore, within that graduate group, there are, you know, there are groups of people who are going to really struggle in the current housing market, which, of course, is not, by the, it's not, by the way, that's not uniform all across the country, but, you know, it's very, very expensive, obviously, in the South. You're going to get graduates who are finding that difficult, but also who are finding it difficult to get, you know, to, to get the kind of economic security. But what we wanted to highlight, really, as well, is that, yes, that's true. So it's true that if you're a graduate, you're more likely to struggle than in the past and that it's a difficult environment now. But if you are non-graduate now, things are even harder. And that's one of the key points. So if you don't have a degree and if you are trying to buy a house, your expectations about your economic prospects are going to be, relatively speaking, worse. Because we still know that graduates, on average, are getting an income return for their degrees. The Institute for Fiscal Studies has shown this. At least, I think, four out of five, on average, get an income return on that, you know, the, insofar as you can measure the additional value your degree affords you in terms of the job market. And if you're a graduate in our data, in the British Election Study data, you could see, well, OK, you might be renting and you might so you're not living with parents and you're renting. And, you know, do you expect to buy a house in the next five to 10 years? And graduates and non-graduates differ. So the graduates are have a higher expectation that they indeed will buy a home in the next five, 10 years. Again, this is 2018, so it might be a little bit different now. But we don't think the gap would be different. You know, the, the expectation, if you're not a graduate, of just getting that, you know, level of income return, getting that level of job security, home security, income returns, is, is harder. And it's not just about expectations of buying a house. It's also that, you know, if you go and ask people, we asked a battery of questions about wealth. And we also asked how economically insecure people feel. 
And one of the questions we asked about wealth, we were trying to go across the whole spectrum. So you could be really, really wealthy, or there's, you know, we wanted to ask questions that would get to people who were in renting accommodation, who had low incomes, but who also maybe had high levels of debt, but also couldn't borrow. And we asked people if they had needed to borrow for essentials in the last 12 months. And we asked people if they needed to come up with a 300 pounds emergency expense, how could they do it? So could they borrow from friends and family? They use their savings or so or could they would they not be able to come up with 300 pounds right now and and there's a really clear distinction there between those younger graduates and non-graduates on these kinds of items so the younger non-graduates by far are the people who are more likely to say yeah they've had to borrow for essentials they couldn't come up with 300 pounds right now they're less likely to have the expectation of buying a home they're, they report higher levels of economic insecurity and you know th that's important because you know when we think about the left behind we might think about places and that's valid. You know, it's not to say that that's not a really important story, part of the picture that, you know, the overall story of economic inequalities in the country. But in a sense, you know, the red herring part of that is it's got to distract us from the question of who really is economically left behind across the generational divide where we know the kind of the pain is starting to be felt in the economy. So it's kind of taking a generational approach, but also an intergen intragenerational approach to say, well, you know, these younger generations, and by the way, they're not young, young, so they're, well, I mean, it depends obviously how old you are. <laughs> Let, let's not get into um, that. Very, very young. Old the, young. The, <laughs> on average, so these are women under 50 and men under 40. So women report higher economic insecurity yeah. for, for longer over older ages. Women report higher economic insecurity overall, as, as do ethnic minorities, or loads of interesting things in this data. But the really crucial thing is, you know, if we think about who are the left behind, who are the people who are going to suffer the most within this kind of economy that's transformed so much over time? And now we've got these massive economic shocks that have happened since. We think it should be the younger non-graduates, at least on average. And there's loads of, obviously, there's loads of variation within those groups that are in, important to understand as well. So that's one of the key observations. And, and then we wanted to kind of understand what's really underlying this. So what's driving this? And obviously trying to investigate, you know, is this a valid measure? Yeah, it looks like, you know, it's very related to savings, to home ownership, whether you own with a mortgage or if you rent or if you own without a mortgage. It's, you know, very related, of course, to income as well. But it's not just income. It's actually there's a low correlation with income. It's correlation, but there's a low correlation. And so when we're using income as a variable, as we so often do, it's, and it's just telling just a small part of the story about people's actual economic circumstances. Mm -hmm. um, and, and this is a point that often comes up in sort of political debates about ta the tax system as well, isn't it? This idea that mm. income tax, although it is a generally progressive tax, isn't a good way really of addressing the huge wealth inequality in the country, that you have a lot of people with a lot of wealth and with very low income. And indeed, this is one of the dilemmas, of course, with, say, a wealth tax, mm. is if you have high wealth but low income, you can be uh, genuinely outraged at how on earth am I going to possibly pay this tax when I have low income? And that gives a political salience yeah. to opposition to wealth taxes, I think, which help, helps explain why moves in those directions have been relatively modest. But that's a, that's a yeah. whole other topic, how our tax yeah. system works. So coming back to your research, what... Having got this really interesting different way of looking at voters and in that sense, classifying them by levels of economic security or insecurity, what conclusions did that set up? What picture does that paint that's different from the conventional political picture? It paints a picture that helps us understand these big, you know, who are, who is losing out on these big economic transformations, as I was just outlining. But we're also able to say, OK, now what's the relationship between people's economic insecurity and their views about Brexit? Um, mm -hmm about immigration and social conservatism and those things are very bundled up together and again I think you know one of the reasons we kind of like you know have this kind of teaser thing with the red herring is that there's a there's a caricature that's built up I think and I don't know how these things build up and I and I you know I think many people probably don't hold this caricature but you see it so frequently that okay we've got this idea in our minds now about somebody who lives in a poorer part of the country who also feels poor who also feels hostile to immigration and very concerned about immigration and cultural change um, and wants, therefore, to vote for Brexit because of their economic grievances. And there's a huge debate in academic circles about this question, you know, the relationship of economics to people's immigration attitudes is very, very kind of long standing. It's been a big debate for a number of years. And it, it's obviously really relevant to the question of Brexit. So do we respond to 
these kinds of immigration based concerns by saying, OK, these these people feel really economically aggrieved. They're in competition or they perceive that they're in competition with immigrants and therefore they have these economic concerns. Or do we look at the roots of people's immigration preferences in a different way and say, actually, many of these people, and, and this is the point that we show, is that most the majority of the people that have the strongest concerns about immigration, who are most pro-leave, are very economically secure. So on average, the most economically secure are the older non-graduates and the older individuals in, overall, and the older non-graduates are the people that are the most pro-leave, and have the you know, strongest cons concerns against immigration and the most socially conservative, which makes no sense because we know that there's a generational divide on this. In a, in a very polite way, I guess, you've just said that quite a lot of what I've said in the past is nonsense. <laughs> because I, I've certainly bought into that alternative viewpoint, which it sounds like the mm -hmm. evidence doesn't really support, that a big part of the motivation for people supporting Brexit was yeah. a sense of the economic and social status quo wasn't working for them. Mm -hmm. Us being a member of the European Union was a significant part of that status quo. And if the status quo isn't working for you, you vote for change and change being Brexit. And yeah. that, therefore, one of the mistakes that pro-Europeans made, um, perhaps particularly the Lib Dems in, say, the 2014 European Parliament elections, was to paint being in the EU as being comfortable with the status quo. And so that then therefore exacerbated that. Mm. But it sounds like that's a pretty flawed uh, train of thought, <laughs> given what you've said. So. I mean, how, you're calling is, me is there anything I can rescue from the rubble of that <laughs> you're calling me polite and I think you're being very generous and very very humble the I, I, so I think what we then this is Rosa de Gais and I we, what we want to show is like let's let's not you know throw the baby out of the bathwater. I mean there's lots of people that have had genuine economic concerns but they but they themselves feel individually secure so let's say you live in a part of the country, it hasn't done as well, house prices haven't risen nearly as much as they have in the south of England, you can see things deteriorating around you, you can see a loss of employment opportunities for younger generations, you may not have lost your own job because of it, but you see those opportunities being lost for other younger generations, and you, you have a sense of economic decline, or you have a sense of economic grievance, but you may yourself feel economically secure, but you might have other issues with the status quo, you might feel uncomfortable with the way the country has changed over time, you may feel uncomfortable with the levels of immigration that you see, perhaps not around you, or perhaps not in your daily life, but you know, the, the general fears of, you know, the people coming into the country, and you see this so often, don't you, in the so much of the tabloid media over many years prior to Brexit, you know, really, you know, if you read that, you would think that there was a tidal wave of massive, of mass immigration that was putting a massive threat on public services and was going to be a mass, you know, a big problem for the whole country. So, you know, you can have concerns about the economy and you can have concerns about the status quo and the direction the country is going in, but you yourself feel individually secure. And is being a parent part of that? Because I wonder for some of those people are economically secure. Yeah. Things that have made them secure, such as some decent workplace pension schemes, lower mm -hmm. property prices, etc., are ones that they could also see that their children, or indeed, I guess, given their age, perhaps their grandchildren as well, mm -hmm. are not able to benefit from. So is, is, is part of it perhaps seeing that the status quo is failing, not because it's failed them personally, but that it, they can see how it's not going to deliver for their, their children or their grandchildren what they were able to get? Yeah, and they themselves may then have to subsidise their own children and their children through inheritances or through loans or through gifts. So it's a great question. It really is a great question. And <laughs> I mean, you haven't we haven't discussed this and, you know, you haven't kind of primed me for this question. But it, but I'm happy to say that it's one that we're starting to investigate because. Okay. So so in another project, myself, Zach Grant and Jeff Evans are um, going to be looking at this very question. And it's and it's a really important question, I think, because. You know, if we think that people are just self-interested, then we get one way of understanding politics. Don't we? And we get this idea that governments now need to cater, or certainly conservative government, may cater, may, the conservative government may cater to older voters who own homes and who, you know, want their pensions protected because those older voters only care about their own circumstances. But if those older voters indeed care about younger generations and care about the environment, you know, the communities around them and the opportunities for people that they're not related to as well, then you get a very different kind of understanding about what older voters indeed want. And it's, you know, understanding the older part of the electorate is really crucial 
I mean, understanding the whole electorate is pretty crucial, but you know, you've got this group that we've in all opinion polls, and it's not a criticism, but over time, you know, you get used to saying, right, over 65s, <laughs> you know, the over 65s think this. And it's like, well, the over 65s are a massive group. They're a heterogeneous group, so they're very varied. And also they're, you know, at the moment, they're a larger part of the electorate because they are turning out in higher numbers than people. And we, you know, we just sort of see, we, we really shouldn't see them just as a kind of one homogenous block of the over 65s. There's huge variation within them, one of which being economic security. And we know that economic security for this group is going to be a really big deal because of those cohort effects and, you know, because of because of the situations in which they find themselves now looking at looking at the loss of opportunities yeah. for the generation. So, yeah, that's the next thing. And yeah, I mean, somebody who is in that over 65s cross tab, I mean, they could have grown up in either the 60s or the 40s or 30s, right. I guess, yeah. as well, for older people, which just, yeah, I mean, I, I don't have experience of growing up in either decade, but that seems like very very different life experiences if just your basic framing and understanding of, of yeah. how the world works what's normal that you get as a child those yeah. are very very different decades aren't they yeah and, and there isn't an even distribution oh sorry this was i'm trying to remember which election was it was the 2015 at general election wasn't it where the polls <clears throat> were not at their finest and <laughs> one of the reasons was that pollsters had too many younger old people so they had the right proportion in their samples after waiting of people age 65 or over but they skewed too much towards people in their 60s or early 70s and not enough you know in the old who were in the 80s or 90s and therefore they were getting you know as as it turned out inaccurate results because you can't simply assume that everyone 65 plus is is similar to each other there's real variations within that group the big one of the big fixes after 2015 was to wait on political attention and the you know the older group are more you know likely to be more attentive to politics so they're you know really really fascinating group and and like you say a really diverse group and also this you know older voters are less likely to vote in certain parts of the I'm sorry live in certain parts of the country and therefore vote in certain parts of the country so the distribution of young and old graduates and non-graduates those with high and low incomes it differs across the country and so those older people, on average, have probably lived in parts of the country that haven't seen perhaps the same amount of growth as some of our metropolitan areas. So that's a different experience again. So what does this all mean for where politics is, is headed? Because I guess a lot of these trends that we've talked about are quite long term, sort of maybe yeah. remorseless, but relatively gradual trends. And yeah. therefore, that suggests that perhaps they're not going to be that important directly in explaining the next general election that this is more a gradual setting of the background noise against which there's all sort of shorter and medium term things mm. that can skew the picture or is it that actually I mean when you're talking about things like economic insecurity that gets so much to the heart of what people think and what motivates them about politics and actually no this is really important in the short term as well what's yeah what's what's the picture mm. therefore you've drawn from this as to sort of where politics is headed Great questions. So on the one hand, you're, you know, you're right that this is a slow process and this relates to the kind of long term expectations that we might have around things like generational replacement. And, you know, one of one of the implications is that if we'd have thought, oh, well, all Labour really needs to do is just kind of bide its time. I mean, a long time, but gradually Labour is going to be, you know, the electorate is going to shift to the left because there are more younger people going to university, university graduates are more liberal. And that's that's going to benefit the Liberal Democrats. It's also going to benefit the Labour Party. But what we find is the graduates who are also secure are cross pressured. They're more likely to vote for the Conservatives than graduates who feel economically insecure. And so there's not, you know, if we if we go and extrapolate that and say, well, what might that mean for the future? Well, that what that might mean is that more of those graduates are going to become secure, and more of those non graduates are not going to become secure. And therefore, the graduates who do become secure are more likely to be cross pressured to parties on the right. So, so that's one of the kind of the long term implications of this, you know, potential implications of the research. I think in the short term, though, I would say two things. One is that I think that what we've found helps us understand why the Conservative Party has done so well in recent times, because the 
you know, you can vote for the Conservatives because of Brexit if you're older and you have pro-Brexit views. Not, of course, not every old person does, but you know, <laughs> people who are older generally tend to be more in favour of leave. But you can also vote for the Conservatives because you feel more secure. And we find this too. You know, the relationship of economic insecurity is as strong in our models, the correlations with vote choice between Conservatives and Labour, as is, for example, people's how they voted in the referendum. So there's kind of two really big reasons to vote for the Conservatives if you're in this secure category and if you are more pro-Leave, more pro-Brexit and some of the things the Conservatives are doing. And I think I think that's been overlooked and it's been that's problematic because, you know, essentially politics then has sounded like it's all gone on to the sort of infamous culture wars issues or second dimension politics. And and actually that really underpins just how important the economy is. And the, the, the second reason I think it's really a short term, the short term implications are, are quite crucial, is that here we find ourselves now in a period where people are going to lose that sense of security that they felt for a long time. And people that don't have that sense of economic insecurity are going to really struggle, really struggle. Because security isn't, it's not income. It's really about having buffers. It's really about being able to kind of, you know, look, I'll be okay because I've got this to fall back on. I don't like it. No one wants to give up their savings or nobody wants to, you know, go into borrow or whatever. But if you had to, you know, you're going to be okay. Or you're not going to lose your home because you own your home and you've paid off a decent chunk of your mortgage or all of your mortgage. So at least no one can take my home away from me. And, you know, the, those kinds of buffers are really crucial for going into a big economic shock because it's that uncertainty, isn't it? It's that unpredictability mm. that makes us feel really, really insecure, really fearful. For the future. So that's happening to a ton of people now. And also those people who have felt secure because they've got some savings and they've, you know, they've got a nest egg or that they can draw on in times of difficulty. Well, they're going to need to use that and perhaps they're going to need to use it for essentials, such as heating the homes. Really terrible situation that, you know, obviously so many people are going to find themselves in, especially this winter. And I think that really means that this question of economic insecurity is really, really important to, to understand at this kind of real timely moment. I'm slightly torn, I think, in listening to that, because there is implication one could draw from that, given the state of the economy and what's, you know, what seems to be in front of us, that that is relatively bad news for the Conservatives, because so Mm -hmm. much of their success has been based on economic security, and there's this growing sense of economic insecurity, um, which I would like in some ways to be the case. I mean, obviously, it would be better if people were happy and feeling more secure, but I would like a trend that is unhelpful for the the Conservatives, definitely, you know, appeals to me. However, the overall picture, as far as I can see, of political science permanently, is to paint longer term trends and pictures about things that should be unhelpful for the conservatives about you know long-term trends trends in demography in levels mm. of education it's there are so many things that have been written over so many years and yet since the second world war the conservatives have won two out of three general elections so that bad news for the conservatives never quite seems to arrive <laughs> so yeah um, and, and there's yeah there's one way of looking at our results and our focus on economic insecurity and security and saying okay well the conservative vote was on average more secure so around two-thirds in 2019 um, in our British election study sample said that the year before that they felt secure they were not worried so we, they didn't express any worry on this scale and you know two-thirds of conservative voters have potentially then gone into these economic shocks able to weather them, relatively speaking, relatively well. So I think that's also one of the things that I think, you know, has an electoral implication, which is that if there's plenty of people shocked at the news, not liking the cost of petrol, but basically okay, you know, are they going to punish the Conservatives for these economic shocks? And I and I think that's why I put a focus on people that could really become insecure when had security pensioners who are on small incomes and they they may be having to dip into savings or such like but no I think the fact that we find that these graduates you know who are more secure more likely to become secure this gap between graduates and non-graduates that we identify it could indeed widen you know there's dangers there for the Tories for, for sure 
because the future of their vote, they really need to be looking at those people that kind of feel more a bit more Brexity, but are more insecure currently. And if they can't deliver a kind of jobs and prosperity and, you know, home ownership and a sense of prospering through this, you know, through this economy, then then that's bad news for the Tories. But the good news for the Tories is, is that many of those graduates are going to feel currently more, more torn towards potentially voting for the Conservative Party in the future. So there isn't this kind of just inevitable demographics. And I think, you know, the more I've kind of studied politics, the more I think nothing's ine- inevitable because you've got this, you know, not everything is kind of this bottom up story. You know, not everything is about electorates changing and shifting and demography. That's what we would call sort of bottom up. You yeah. know, it's much more about demand. You've also got this supply top down part of the story, which is that, you know, political parties are changing their offerings yeah. and their reputations and their abilities to deliver and, and stand with people and different groups over time. So, you know, it's it's a moving feast. Much more and I think in what you were saying there, there's a hint of, I guess, the politics of the early 1990s, where again, a very big economic down, Conservative government, very big economic downturn, and the Conservatives, however, went on to win the 1992 general election. And I'm trying to remember the exact figure, but it's something like half of Britons ended up financially better off through that economic downturn. So although it was a severe Mm. economic downturn, there was a Mm. big chunk of the electorate that was relatively economically secure, and while oh. you know, that doesn't mean that you're callous and ignore bad news that you see around you or mm. you know, relatives or colleagues or in your community, that fundamentally for them, the experience of, of the recession was a very, very different experience because they were, in that sense, the lucky half. And I guess part of what you're saying is, is now is, is similar to what we've seen through COVID, but we might also free, see through, for example, this surge in inflation, mm. is that for some people, they may you know, recognise that there are problems for others and that may influence their political choices. But even really bad economic news normally still leaves quite a few people as well or better off at the end of it, doesn't it? Yeah, I think I think that's absolutely right. As part of survey research, you know, there there have been some real classic measures that people have used for many, many years to study economic voting. One of them is, is the, is the you know, national economy getting better or worse? Has it, you know, in the past 12 months or is, is it what's it going to do in the next 12 months? And then you also ask, and your own, what about your own and household finances? Have they got worse in the last 12 months? Have they got better? Now, those things are still going to matter. The direction of travel is still going to matter. And I would be absolutely amazed if that wasn't bad news for the Tories. <laughs> so we're going to look yeah. at the economy and say, oh my gosh, things are getting worse. And I don't feel optimistic about the future. We had an election now, or indeed, <laughs> you know, some as the rumor mill constantly <laughs> keeps on tossing updates. You know, you're going to get this. You're going to get this sense of national economic worsening situation, but also people's personal finances are going to get worse. Most people. Yeah. So you're right to point out that some people are going to get are going to be fine, and some going to people are going to do better. But what if everybody's done a bit worse? For some people, it really matters. And for some people, it's just a bit of an annoyance, really. And I think that's the key difference. That's, that's what we're able to do using this kind of focus on security. You say, OK, so my, my own personal finances have got worse in the last 12 months, but I'm not, you know, I don't feel, I feel much more worried about other people who are, you know, who are struggling and I'm able to, to get through this, you know, particular period of economic turmoil. It's, it's going to be hopefully fine for us. But you know, that doesn't mean that I'm immune to the, you know, the, to the wider national picture. Of course it doesn't. But it's, but if you don't study people's own economic circumstances, all you'll see is, oh, my, my economy's got worse, my economic situation's got worse, or indeed it's got, you know, it stayed the same. Um, and you're not going to get a sense of why it is that those people aren't then punishing yep. the government for their own personal situation. That's really interesting. Before we wrap up, there's one other bit of the report I thought would be useful to discuss, which is table A4. And I mentioned that not just to check that you can remember what table A4 is, but also (laughs) as an encouragement to listeners, the link to the full report is in the show notes. Please do do go and have a look at that. But what you do in that table is split the electorate into four quadrants Mm. based on, on the one hand, whether they're culturally liberal or conservative, and on the other hand, whether they're economically secure or insecure. So you've got the sort of liberal and secure, liberal and insecure, sort of conservative and secure, conservative and insecure, those sort of four four quadrants. Mm -hmm. And I guess the culturally liberal and secure 
is the archetypal blue wall type territory that in yeah. many ways is at the heart of you know success or failure for the Lib Dems at the next general election I, mm -hmm. I think that's the sort of the, the, the slightly caricatured but mm -hmm. you know, reasonable way of looking at that quadrant and of course it then begs the question in part or prompts the question sorry not beg prompts the question in part uh, for Lib Dems is well which other quadrants should the party particularly aim for is it better to aim for other people who are also liberal but might be insecure or maybe people who are conservative but insecure that maybe you know that that's that, that sort of insecurity of it maybe gives an opening to dislike the government and so on even if on values they might not agree as much but I guess the slightly yeah. depressing thing from the point of view of, of, of a liberal democrat is looking at those quadrants is you make the sort of culturally liberal and economically secure quadrant only 14 percent of the electorate mm -hmm. and even if you add in the culturally liberal and economically insecure you only get to 27 percent of the electorate being liberal on your definition which is um, a lower number than in some other studies that in different ways segment the electorate so i wonder just what what was your definition of culturally liberal or culturally conservative in that table and how sort of hardline liberal do you have to be to hit the liberal half of the table? Ah, well, that's a good question. So we use, and, and one of the interesting things one could do is, is to cut, take different cut points mm. on a particular scale. So what we're doing there is we're using a standard liberal, so social conservatism scale that is comprised of several items. And then we've standardized all the scales together. And so we've taken people that are below average on yeah. that scale. And so you could take people who were, you know, somewhat, you could say, okay, well, let's, let's like include the average or let's, you know, then you're going to get a bigger group. And we've looked at that on the immigration scale as well. And we've done exactly the same thing. So we've standardized all these scales and we said, right, let's look at below average or average and above. And let's, let's look at, you know, what are the proportions when we do it this way so you could you know you could slightly play around with that but it's no but it's also no surprise that the majority of the electorate is more socially conservative than the liberal socially liberal and that those people who are more socially conservative tend to be older and those you know older individuals tend to be more secure which is why you have you end up with small proportion for economically secure and socially liberal because you're looking at essentially what we would say well okay you're probably you know on average most likelihood is you're looking at graduates there who are more likely to be liberal you're looking at younger graduates who are secure and you know there, there are <laughs> many of these younger graduates are going to accrue greater security over their lifetime so that's good news for liberal democrats potentially if they stick with the liberal democrats on the basis of their social liberalism but if obviously as we said before if they feel cross pressured to vote for another party on the basis of their economic security then then they might not stick with the lib dems but technically that group would be growing so the economically liberal i'm sorry the secure and socially liberal group will be growing because there are more graduates younger graduates in the electorate than there are older graduates and there are more gra graduates who are younger than there are younger non-graduates so that group should should enlarge over time technically but as we've said you know that that doesn't mean that group is solely attached to one political party or one political direction but i think you know in terms of I, in terms of that appeal you is you know let's what about the liberal voter who is more economically insecure mm -hmm. then you know i'd say yeah, absolutely so you know in the current crisis given the economic shocks given those kinds of you know those kinds of individuals who are younger now who have the expectations that they should have had the kinds of economic benefits of from society that their parents or their grandparents had who have more liberal attitudes those people who feel more economically insecure they're much more likely to you know to to yeah to feel cross pressured to be looking for a political home and yeah that i think would be an interesting way yeah. to think about that. And, and i guess the other element to bear in mind is that people who come out as relatively socially conservative on this scale may still have views that not that many years ago would have been considered fairly liberal if yeah. you think how much the consensus position has changed on issues such as same-sex marriage or same-sex adoption yeah that's fair that's fair so what that means is that that scale is essentially going to look more you know being in the middle might be more Liberal. So if it's not too cheeky, a nice question perhaps to end on is if you were giving the Liberal Democrats any political strategic advice based on your research, what would what would that advice be? 
oh it's, no it's not too cheeky at all so I think one of the one of the main pieces of advice is that I don't think we're all in this second dimension political space all the time and I think there's been so much focus on this since Brexit so so much and I think you know moving on back onto economics could be very valuable lesson to learn so I think that's that is actually one of those crumbs of comfort as well isn't it I think potentially for Liberal Democrats given that Brexit is one of those issues that you know politically at least you know has just been incredibly difficult space to navigate for the political parties and you know some kind of acceptance of getting on with it has to be part of all political parties kind of orientations at the moment or making the best of it so I think that's that's one lesson I think the other lesson would be not to assume that just because you've got you've got a younger graduate or indeed an older graduate that they're definitely you know always going to be a natural Lib Dem and there needs to be a, obviously a real focus on what those individuals care about which is also their their own economic security and I think I would hope what we really try to focus on as well is let's really understand who the left behind are, because any political party that's interested in progressive politics, who's interested in you know, resolving some of the big economic conundrums of our time, really needs to focus on that question. And I think you know, moving away from, oh, the economically left behind live over there. We know that's not true. We know that the economically left behind are living all around us. You know, we're a highly divided society, but in very small spaces, <laughs> you know, in small locations of the country. And I think, you know, focusing on those people who are really suffering in the current economic context, they're likely, at least, you know, there's a chance that they're going to come from this group who are not graduates and they feel economically left behind. And I think pitching a, an appeal to those people on the basis of economics is, is, is you know, certainly something that I hope will all political parties will think hard about. That's been really fascinating, Jane. Thank you so much for that. Listeners can find Jane on Twitter at Prof Jane Green, and I'll include a link to the report in the show notes. You can also find me on Twitter at Mark Pack and this podcast at Bar Chart Podcast. So thank you hugely for your time, Jane. I'll also include a link to your previous appearance on this podcast where we Thanks, talked Tom. about whether British politics was becoming less volatile or not. I hope, I, I can't remember, <laughs> but I hope we concluded <laughs> that, it, that it wasn't becoming less volatile. Otherwise that may have aged a little bit badly. But we also, I do remember, had a fascinating discussion about how important competence as opposed to ideology is. And yeah. therefore whether, for example, Keir Starmer being seen as boring but competent actually might be sufficient. I think it's, it's, it's an episode I would heartily recommend people go back uh, to listen to. And Thank if you, you did like listening to this show, please do tell others about this podcast and give it a rating or review in your favourite podcast app. Thank you, everyone, for listening. Mm-hmm.